the young audience. For that, that are a father and you have a kid, you know, you know that this is an amazing moment. It's an amazing moment of your life. But sometimes kids are not like that. Sometimes kids doesn't want to move, doesn't want to go to any place. And at the end of the day, what happened is that they cry. And you need to take it in your hands, and you need to make it move. And you need to be basically his transportation system. So what happened here? What, why we are working? Because we want to know what we want to give to our kids, OK? What's the problem to be solved? Look, guys, this is the metro of Santiago de Chile. We were with the minister of Santiago de Chile. Of Chile. He was talking about the beauty of the new metro system in Santiago. And this is what is happening there, OK? We are building infrastructure that we cannot afford. You know, this is the metro of Dubai. Equipment switch off for energy consumptions. That's what we find when we go and we travel. And, you know, we are in an airport having an amazing, incredible journey. And, of course, everybody knows who is going, except your travel, except your baggage. You know, you have no idea. And this is happening every, every day. So let's talk about security for a while. You know that right now, everything that we are doing going through security basically is bullshit. Because depending on where you put the gun, you could go, and they don't even find it. For all of you that live in Sao Paulo, this is a normal thing. And you think that is bad. You really think that is a bad thing, having a traffic jam like that? OK, that's because. Probably you have never been in Jakarta. You have never been in Indonesia. Or you have never been in Beijing. That's Beijing in a sunny day. In a cloudy day, you cannot even see your hands. OK? So there is a problem. There is a real problem to be solved. Basically, transportation is dictating the way we live. OK? If I live in one place in Los Angeles and she's living in, you know, like 100, you know, in other area of Los Angeles, I'm not going to date her. It's impossible. It's not going to happen. It's not going to work. OK? What if I tell you that you could die tomorrow? How many things you haven't done that you'd like to do? So, you know, this is happening to all of us. We are losing time, you know, of our life because of air pollution. If you live in one of the cities, your average lifetime is going to be reduced by 18 months, 22, 33, 50 months in Tehran, 36 months. Air pollution, you know, this is the world that we are going to give to our children. A polluted world. So, basically, we believe that we have a solution for this, okay? Transportation has been, humanity has been thinking about transportation in a tube for a long period of time, you know? In 1870, they were already talking about it, okay? The tube, nobody knows, but the first, the first uh, area of the metro of New York, basically they were thinking in a pneumatic tube. At that moment, there was not the possibility to create it because there was not enough technology. Something is happening here. <laughs> but anyway, so you know, the first patent comes from Robert Goodard in 1904. Okay. At that moment, he was already talking about traveling in a tube. And if you see the patent, and you read it, I don't know if you can read it, guys, but they talk about vacuum tube, OK? They already talk about air exhausting pump, pumps. They talk about air tight. So you know, basically, some of the ideas that are behind Hyperloop were already in the minds of humanity in 1904. 
Okay? Then in the 60s, Popular Science, a very, very uh, important magazine there, and the Secretary of Transportation of the United States was talking about traveling in a tube. Something happened there. Then the Jetsons, 1992 Swiss train. The Simpsons. And finally, Elon Musk, you know? So what's Hyperloop? Let's take a look to one video that we have to understand better what's Hyperloop, OK? I have a name for it, name for it which is called the Hyperloop. So what's Hyperloop? Mr. Musk's plan, move people using a massive vacuum tube combined with a magnetic levitation system, kind of like a Jetsons tunnel. It's something like that, yeah. Traveling by Hyperloop is going to be the future. They're, going to, they're making this. Imagine a capsule filled with people. You put this capsule inside the tube. You create a low pressure environment inside the tube. So you have no resistance. And it's moving very fast from point A to point B. So the capsule, very similar to an airplane that goes in high altitudes, uh, can travel really fast with very little energy. Is the main trick to it uh, the vacuum and the fact that there's no friction? Is that the, the main reason yeah. why it makes it so fast? Tesla founder Elon Musk proposed this new technology called Hyperloop, and it's being developed right now in Playa Vista here in this hangar behind me. Company Hyperloop has teamed up with the students to create this tube technology. So when Elon published the document, he just drafted a possible way to achieve this. Two months later, uh, my business partner, Dirk Alborn, a genius German entrepreneur, uh, took this document, published in our website, the Jumpstart Found, and did a call to action. There was a great project, a great idea, and Elon actually said he wanted someone else to take it on. He wanted the community to make this happen. It's the first company that used crowdsourcing to solve one of the biggest problems of humanity, that is transportation. They have to work at least 10 hours a week, and we give them in exchange one stock for every hour worked. And we have been like overwhelmed of requests from engineers from all over the planet. Mm. There were people from you know NASA, Tesla, SpaceX, uh, yeah. Boeing, MIT. We want to give the, uh, our community that's supporting us the possibility to own parts of, uh, of the company. So we are creating the biggest crowdsourcing project in the planet. The company says it already has several potential investors and wants to take Hyperloop to China in the future. Big headline of the day. Hyperloop's chief operating officer, Bipov Gresta, the transportation technology startup, believes that the Hyperloop will be cheaper than high-speed rail in the country. Take a look. You have to consider that the Hyperloop is not a new idea. Uh, humanity tried to build this system several times in the past. India has a, a very big problem on infrastructure. The race is on. Elon Musk's vision for a high-speed passenger pods, known as the Hyperloop, is one step closer to becoming reality this morning. One of the known companies competing to capitalize on Musk's proposal, announcing today it has struck a deal with landowners in Central California to build the first full-scale Hyperloop along a five-mile stretch along I-5. Uh, Dirk, tell me about this deal and, and really when you expect this Hyperloop, this five-mile stretch to be finished. Quay Valley is supposed to be breaking ground um, beginning of 2016. We are able today to announce at the World Economic Forum the actual filing of the uh, construction permit mm. to the Kings County. From dream to reality, the Hyperloop, the vacuum tube trans transport company that wants to connect San Francisco and Los Angeles at 760 miles an hour could happen in as little as four years. Bebop Gresta is Hyperloop Transportation Technology COO and Deputy Chairman. He joins me out here today. Uh, it's good to see you, Bebop. And, and, Thank you, Kelly. And I'm learning a lot about the Hyperloop being out here. We announced uh, the start of the construction of the full-scale prototype in Quay Valley, north of Los Angeles. Can you imagine uh, and walk us through what it might be like to travel at the speed of sound? 
it's not going to be much difference than uh, sitting in an airplane. Actually. In railroads, most accidents were all human factors. Plus, a lot of the derailments are actually happened because something's on the track. So we're in a closed system. We're completely managed by a computer system. Will the Hyperloop kill the railroad? The so Hyperloop is going to do to the US what the railroads did in the 1800. So um, it will change the way we live. It's possible today. It's based on existing technologies and it's the right time, it's the right moment to finally get something doing like this. Is it visionary? In 30 years time, <laughs> will you and I be sitting on our rocking chairs going, well, we talked about it then and he did it. Do so you think this is possible? This is not just... Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, guys. So basically, this is a, a small summary of our history of the last three years, you know. What is important to understand when we talk about Hyperloop is that it's built on existing technologies, you know. We are not talking about something that is sci-fi. We are not talking about something completely new. We are just researching and seeing the best technologies in the world, putting it together and, you know, make it happen. So basically, what is Hyperloop? Imagine a train. You put that train in a tube. You vacuum the environment, so you have the, a low-pressure environment. You make it levitate, so basically you have no friction with the air and no friction with the track, you know. You put people inside that, you make it smaller to optimize the infrastructure and use a capsule instead of a big train. And basically, uh, you shoot the people at 1,200 kilometers per hour. That looks nice, eh? It's a nice experience. So anyway, so some more information more about Hyperloop. So basically, as I was explaining, we reduce the eye resistance, we optimize the tube and the capsule size, and one important, very, very important thing, we make it energy positive, you know? So, so let's go. What is important for us, okay? When we start to think about this project, we didn't want to create a new infrastructure that solved one problem of humanity and create 10. We wanted to create something that was sustainable, okay? So the first goal was to make it, you know, to make it energy net positive. So we are, have been working with different areas of research. We know that solar uh, energy is affordable more and more every day. We are using solar, we are using uh, regenerative braking, we are using in some climates geothermal, and we are also studying how to integrate in the infrastructure, you know, the, um, the wind uh, turbines. And we know that history is working with us. Time is working for us, you know. If you see the evolution of the price history of the silicon PV cells, you know, per watt has been huge. And we know that it's going to continue like that. But, of course, developing Hyperloop, having a system that is very, you know, that is very fast, that is very sustainable, but is not safe, was not a, a possibility, you know. We, need, we knew that safety was a paramount for us. But think about the system a little bit. It's weather immunity. It's a system that is completely insulated from the environmental, have zero traffic intersections, and it's really, really hardened envelope. So what happened is that, by definition, we are talking about a system that is much, much more safer than actual systems. And we study what was the actual situation. And we come up with some numbers, and we saw that basically every 3.7 years, one airplane is going to crash. And we believe that it's unacceptable and that we can create standards, safety standards that could be 10 times better. We create new materials. We create a material called vibranium, but basically it's a two layers composite material with sensor inside that will allow us to, you know, to have a much, a much better control of the capsule and the pod. 
So if something happens on the outside cell, you will be safe because you have the internal cell and it's sensorized and monitorized continuously. So safety is a paramount for us. Outside the skin has 10 times the specific strength of a steel. And the outside is 2.5 times more rigid than aluminum. So we are researching, investigating in every area to be sure that we do the things in a better way. Anyway. Let's talk for a moment. Let's continue talking about, about safety. In an emergency stop, you know, in a standard stop, we have like 32 seconds, okay? And you will be stopping at 1G. At 1G, basically, it's very, it's very gentle, okay? It's not like uh, something uh, difficult or rough. In the stream stop, we would be able to stop the capsule at 6.4 seconds, okay? And at 5G. Of course, it's going to be a rough stop, but you are going to be safe. You are going to be there, and, you know, nothing is going to happen, so... But, you know, when we were thinking and thinking about Hyperloop again, there was one thing that also was important for us. We saw at the beginning of the presentation, passenger experience, you know, let's enjoy the journey, you know. How long has been since people was thinking on traveling like a nice experience? So we think that we have technologies today available to make, you know, a much better and pleasant journey. So we create that we call one of our projects was augmented and virtual windows. Of course, we are, in a, we are in a tube. We don't see anything outside. But that's a great opportunity, you know, to create something that looks like a window. And can, you can go, you can go through Paris and see what is there. Or maybe you want to change and you want to go through Mars, or you want to go through, uh, through Jurassic World. So, And that, of course, will give us different alternatives of monetization. So we have developed this technology, again, in collaboration with a company called Refred that is in Munich. That is a company leader in AR, VR, and you know, so. But OK, guys, we have talked about how we are doing it and what do we want to solve. But if there is something that we are really, really proud is how are we doing it, OK? We are building companies in a completely different way. And that's important. That's really important. Normally, you know, when you talk about this kind of projects, projects about infrastructures, things are done behind closed doors. Nobody knows. Nobody understands what is the technology there. What are, is there a return of investment? There is no, you know, that kind of things. But we decided that we wanted to do this in a completely different way. We take the idea, we put it in our web, in our crowdsourcing platform, Jamstar Fund, and we did a call to action. And we say to everybody, we are going to do this together. We are going to create not a company. We are going to create a movement. And we are going to crowdsource. And believe me, it's amazing. Because when you have that opportunity, you really can solve big problems, you know? So we start to make some questions. We start to talk about, do you want to join the team? What is going to be our revenue model? What do you like best about our infrastructure? What are your ideas? Can we do this? Can we do that? And of course, you know, innovation is about asking the same question three or four different times to as, much, as many people as possible, OK? That is going to give you an incredible, incredible uh, force you know to develop so what's what we believe we don't believe that we are a company you know we believe the transportation revolution is built on a movement we have more than 87,000 media articles we have more than 5 billion you know reached in internet we are a global movement we are doing it all over the world is this is not a company from top to down our people is working and created you know we have the different circles created We have generated a global value of more than 4.7 billion in terms of brand. 
and everybody's talking about Hyperloop. And that's important, because if we want that this project is successful, we need to do it worldwide. One of the biggest problems in the past was that there were local projects, and that local projects, when they didn't have financing, they didn't have the political support, or they didn't have whatever circumstances, were not working. So how we work, OK? Let's talk a little bit more about how are we working. We are powered by passion. We scout talent for all over the world, OK? We have more than 600 professionals and more than 40 companies. I guess I have to come here, because if not, it doesn't work. More than 40 companies uh, working with us, OK? We have brilliant minds all over the world, people that is working in different companies, Tesla, SpaceX, um, NASA, MIT, you know? And we have generated, uh, we have created, we are citizen funded. We have done more than 60,000 man hours have been empowered without accepting one single investor dollar, okay? So basically, if you see, we have our community that is more than 30,000 people. We have what we call our team that is the 600 collaborators. They work, you need to work a minimum of 10 hours a week, okay, in exchange of stock options. So we are creating the company and raising the value of the company all together, okay? Our key partner, core team, and basically always, always very focused in innovation. So that's a map of different collaborators that we have. Difficult to see, but anyway, nice. We have Vivo Gresta, that is our chairman and co-founder, a brilliant uh, Italian entrepreneur that created more than 70 companies. Dirk Arbor, our co-founder and CEO. And you know, we have collaborators all over the place, all over the world, people that is working in Hyperloop. And this is happening to our company every day. Right now, we have an average of between 10 and 15 different applications every day, you know? And yes, we have created a, a movement. And as a result, there are other companies that are forming to, you know, to, to make this happen, OK? And we want to show you different companies, different opportunities, different possibilities. But why do we talk about this? Because if you want to join, we want that you join the right one, hyperloop.global. <laughs> OK? That's the opportunity. So we have key partners. You know, key partners are peop uh, companies that are also partnering with us to make it happen. Paul Hastings, one of the biggest uh, legal firm in the United States. Atkins, one of the biggest engineering design companies in the world. Label vacuum. These guys were the inventor of the vacuum pump, and they are basically our vacuum team. You know, anomaly, the advertising agency of Google, Facebook take us like a beta project. You know, for Facebook at work, we work and collaborate with this uh, thing and different different partners. But you know, the last thing uh, or the last message I would like to give today is that 
Hyperloop is happening. You know, it's not like it's not going to happen in 40 years. It's not sci-fi. It's happening right now. Okay, we are negotiating more than 20 system sales. You know, creating multi-billion-dollar construction value. We are ready to build. You know, of course, we will build today the version number one, and we are working in research and development for developing the next versions. Okay, but we are really ready to build. In four years, you know, in three years, we have generated more than 40 utility patents. More, you know, we have the trademark registered in 38 people, uh, countries. We have California, Slovakia, a project in Toulouse, UAE, uh, Czech Republic, you know, feasibility studies, projects that we are doing. We have more than 47 leading companies working with us. We, we signed a deal in Quay Valley you know, to, to have uh, an Hyperloop Research and Development Center and a prototype track. We are finishing the environmental permits. Unfortunately, it's taking more time than we expected, but anyway, it's on track. We are working with Abu Dhabi in a feasibility study between Abu Dhabi and Alain, the city of Alain. We have some financial backing right now. The Sheikh Farah bin Sayed signed an agreement with Hyperloop Transportation Technologies to be our sponsor in the, in the UAE. We have an agreement with the government of Bratislava, Slovakia, to do a feasibility study between Vienna and Bratislava, and now Vienna, Breno. Eh, sorry, Bratislava, Breno. Okay. And anyway, in three years, we have gone from being an idea, put it in a crowdsourcing platform, to what we think that 2018, 2019, we will be able to test our first passenger and our first start. And I don't want to finish without using something that we always say in our company, you know? For those who say it can be done, you know what? Should not interrupt those doing it. So thank you to everybody, okay? Thank you, guys. Now, if you have any questions, I would be more than happy to, to answer. Any questions? No questions. Oh. <laughs> Hello. Okay, there's, uh, I'll ask in English. Uh, so, Sorry. what? Sorry. No problem. So, how can this pursue the cities to invest in this kind of. of Sorry, I, I, I cannot hear you. Okay. How will this? How will you encourage the cities to invest in this kind of solutions? And sorry, but I cannot hear you. <laughs> how are the cities encouraged to invest in this kind of agreements or solution? And what's the return to the passengers? So, wh which are the costs compared to traditional means of transportation? Well, okay. Um, basically, you know, how do we encourage governments and cities to to think on this? Is Basically, we believe that our model will change drastically the way we live. If you think in a city like Sao Paulo, for instance, with 20 million inhabitants, you know, living all together and all of that, and you think that I can put you to live in 250 kilometers away from the city and stay in the city center in 10 to 15 minutes, that is going to change drastically. There is other sample that we always talk, you know, for instance, when we talk in Toulouse about uh, Toulouse Montpellier are two cities that now belong to the same state in France, okay? So if you need to decide where to invest, what happens if the two cities are basically joined by the Hyperloop? 200 kilometers that you could do in 20 minutes. So basically you have the same city. Now as a politician, you don't have to be worried if you are investing here or there, okay? You can have the university here and the hospital in the other city and everything will work for everybody, okay? Regarding uh, basically what is the main uh, advantage of our infrastructure, it's not only about the capex, okay? The capex of, of the project is, is better than the actual capex of the high speed rail, but the main thing is the operational cost, okay? There is no a single infrastructure right now in the world that is profitable in terms of rails, okay? Uh, Metro of New York, for instance, costs one, uh, 0 0.8 cents and the taxpayer are subsidizing $3 per ticket. So, and like that, 
all. You know, I can show you different examples. So our goal and what we can say is that our infrastructure will have a return of investment between 10 to 15 years. Why? Because the operational cost will be very, very low. That's the main key. Different. É, vocês podem fazer pergunta em português também, tá? Só para avisar. Hi. Uh, uh, in the stage you currently are, uh, do you face, do you, do you guys foresee any challenges uh, with government and regulations you may face in the near future? Yeah, definitely. That's that's a very good question because that's the key. At the end, you know, in the history of humanity. You know, innovation came first and regulation goes later, okay? That's why we are also doing this effort to be all around the world talking with different governments because we believe that it's time to go at the same time. We believe that we can advance in parallel. So when we are partnering with governments, sometimes it's not about creating nothing right now. Sometimes it's also about thinking on how can we partner to create the new regulations of the future. We need to be sure that the big areas of regulation in the world, you know, are, uh, you know, help us and the big government help us to create that regulation in parallel to innovation. But that's a very, very good concern that we have, okay? Uh, my name is Rafael Meyer, and <laughs> I think that is when I go here. Yeah. Okay. So I will just stay here. We 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 sign a imaginary. <laughs> no. Hello. Hello. Okay. We're from the State University of Campinas, and I would like to ask you how. How can you ensure the security of the people, the passengers? Sorry, uh, but it, I, I don't hear anything. <laughs> can you? Yeah. Can, come on. How do you? Ensure the security of the passengers. Yeah, okay. It's kind of okay. I like understand. Good. Okay, the guy was asking me how do we insurance the, the safety of the passenger, okay, in a vacuum environment. Well, first of all, you know, uh, basically this is going to be like moving in, a, in an environment that is going to be a mixture between an airplane and the space, okay? Kind of, we are like kind of in the middle, okay? So, of course, you know, if something happened to the capsule, we need to be uh, sure that we are able to repressurize the, the system very, very fast. So the system has like two bulbs every kilometer that close the area where the capsule has been stopped and repressurize automatically in one to two seconds, you know, to come back to have a normal environment. Of course, only in case of extreme emergy, emergency and if you have any problem on the, on the, on the capsule. Once that is done, then you will be able to evacuate the tube, like today in the tunnels, you know, you have a evacuate area, you know, to go out, okay? Uh, hi. So I, I have two quick questions to you, one regarding the past and other the future. First, the past, uh, what are the main challenges in, in R&D that you have faced? And if uh, there has any point in time that you doubt, that you have any doubt, that you could do it. And the second question is, suppose that you have deployed Hyperloop in all mega cities in the world, then the question is, what comes next? What uh, you, you do to reinvent yourself and keep Sorry, innovating? Sorry, repeat, repeat the second one, please. The second one, imagine that you have deployed the Hyperloop system all around the world and you are successful, everyone is using. My question is, what's next? Okay. What are you going to do to reinvent yourself? Okay. So, you know, first question, what was the biggest challenge in the past? You know, doing this project and doing it basically at the beginning with no money, you know, and by a crowdsourcing, that has been challenging. Has been really extremely rewarding, but has been challenging. And basically, we are learning as we go. 
okay? We are creating a new way of building companies. So we need new tools, we need new management thinking, we need new approach to the problems, and that has been the biggest challenge. We are, I, I like to say that we are swimming and building the boat at the same time, okay? So that's nice, okay? But that has been the big challenge. Regarding the future, how do we see the future? Well, first of all, we think that we are only one part of the solution. There is an ecosystem that has to be created to solve mobility problems, okay? But definitely, we are already thinking that Hyperloop uh, phase one is a capsule in a tube. Hyperloop phase two, ideally, would be a self-driving car sharing going from your house to the tube and going directly, okay? And we are already talking with car manufacturers about that and about that ambition in that future. Oh. Hi. Uh, I want to make a question regarding Brazil. Brazil is a very big country, uh, continental size, and we have here uh, big issues regarding transportation and infrastructure. So what do you think Brazil has to do to join this Hyperloop movement? Okay, well, we are, you know, we are starting to talk, you know, right now with Brazilian authorities. We believe that there are opportunities, you know. Of course, everybody here talks about the, uh, the Sao Paulo Rio problem <laughs> and all of that. Okay, that's on the table, okay. But we also think Hyperloop could be for passengers, could be also for, for freight, you know. Brazil is a big producer of raw materials. Maybe there are opportunities to move that raw materials for the internal to the ports in a much more efficient way. So again, there are a lot of opportunities. What we try to do is we sit down with the governments in one side and we hear, but we also create that local community. And I encourage all of you, please, join the movement. It's nice, it's a nice journey. And you know, people from the area, people that is local is the one that can really tell us what's the best for the country. Okay, come on guys, we are not the typical company, multinational company coming here to dictate how do we think or how do we uh, visualize the future. We want you helping us to make that future together and to have that idea, you know? So the question is how do you envision more than how do I envision? Because you are from Brazil and you probably have a much better knowledge of that. So if a lot of people like you help us, that will work, okay? Olá, bom dia. É, meu nome é Letícia e eu gostaria de saber o valor atualmente quando sairia esse projeto para ser vendido, né, para algum país. Ai, de novo, vai. Tá. Eu gostaria de saber o valor atualmente que seria vendido esse projeto, né, para algum país. How much? Sorry, can you repeat? Que seria vendido o projeto? How much it would cost? Isso, os custos. Ok, good. Well, well, we are hyperloop transportation technologies, you know? We are creating the technologies and we will partner with different companies to build and to operate the system. Depending on the orography, depending on, you know, on different things, the cost per kilometer could change drastically, ok? So there is not like a, that's why the first thing, the first step when we go to a country, you know, it's two areas. First, talking about innovation, well, three areas. Talking about innovation, how can we boost innovation locally and how can the local community help us to build this? Second, uh, talking about what are the problems of the country, you know, and how can we solve the, the big problems together? And then understanding what are the, the priorities. And normally, normally, when we identify a possibility, you need to do like in a normal infrastructure, a feasibility study to really understand what would be the cost, what is the return of investment, and you know, and if 10 years, 15 years, when, you know, and uh, you know, what is the demand that is attached to that project. 
So the numbers vary completely depending on the R. OK? I hope I answered. Um, hi. Um, from what I understand, Elon Musk brought back the idea of Hyperloop. Definitely, I cannot go more than this line. OK, so from what I understand, um, Elon Musk was the one responsible for bringing back the idea of Hyperloop in 2013. And my question is, um, um, the current projects that are working on the technology, um, uh, the company that you answer for, is it completely um, parallel and separated from uh, Elon Musk? Because from what I see is that he's still doing his, uh, SpaceX is still hosting the Hyperloop project and uh, bringing back um, universities to work on the project. But what I want to know is that what's the relationship between the company that you're working for and um, the original picture, um, which is SpaceX and Elon Musk? OK, good. If you have seen in the video, basically Elon Musk put the idea. He created the white paper. And basically, he says that he doesn't have time to develop it. So he would support the ideas and he would encourage uh, companies to to be created. At that moment, we were working in that project of Java Star Fund that was uh, was about how do you can you build companies using internet, you know, and you know we put it, we posted, and we created. So we have no relation on that. We asked for permission to put it. Well, permission was given, and we have developed it all Hyperloop by ourselves. Okay, there are other companies that are also forming. Uh, Elon is not part of any of the companies, but when he created the white paper, uh, he promised he was going to support a SpaceX competition all over the world, and it's happening, you know, and they are doing things. Uh, students are coming from all over the world, and last week they had uh, one of the, of the uh, tests of one of the part of the competition. Well, you know, certainly there is something there that maybe could be used, okay? We don't know. You know, we have our own path. And we are talking with some of that students. There are technologies and things that could be interesting. But being completely honest, to our idea right now has surpassed a, a lot. You know, just after three years of developing with a lot of people involved, you know, we are a much more further stage, you know? Mais perguntas aqui desse lado? Hi, I will ask you in Portuguese. Uh, opa, bom dia. Uh, eu queria saber se como é que vocês fazem para administrar, gerenciar toda essa equipe de engenheiros e pessoas que trabalham uh, pelo mundo todo. Uh, que eu queria que você falasse um pouquinho de como é que funciona isso, como vocês avaliam o trabalho dessas pessoas e como é que uh, como é que é, né? Yeah. Well, that's a very good question because we don't manage them. <laughs> OK. <laughs> well, we have our ideas. We have our uh, big areas of development that we launch and we manage. OK, it was a joke. But the reality is that when you've got the luxury of having people that is passionate, it's not about how do you tell them what to do. It's also about what do they do. We are not building the company top to down. We are building the company in circles. We always talk about an onion with different you know, with different slides. So that's how we define our company. Of course, we are creating tools and, you know, tools, tools and management tools that help us to manage this, OK? But uh, it's important to understand, OK? It's very, very important to understand that we, we work in, you know, with a lot of freedom. The different teams has his own freedom, has his own hypermaster that decides what are the priorities? And then we integrate everything together. So we are doing like the integration, OK? So the, the project is, is growing from the bottom to the top and not to the opposite, OK? In a much more uh, simple answer, we work with a Scrum. We have a sprints of three months. We uh, use agile methodology. We have adapted that methodology to the crowdsourcing environment and, you know, we are creating all of that. Hi. Uh, when the first Hyperloop will be working? 
when the first Hyperloop will be working, and where, California or Europe? Well, that's, uh, that's a difficult thing to say, <laughs> okay? Because basically we are pushing in every place and whoever comes first will happen, okay? Uh, right now we are advancing a lot in Abu Dhabi, that's clear. You know, there is a big interest there, you know, to make it us to be the first. Everybody want to be the first, okay? Uh, in California we are, you know, with the environmental study that is taking us much more time for regulations that we expected at the beginning. So it's difficult to say right now. But you know, what we are doing is we are pushing in different areas. We have closed a deal with Toulouse the other day too. And we will try that. But definitely it's gonna be soon, you know? It's not 10 years, okay? And it's not tomorrow. But we hope that in one, two years, we will be able to be showing. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much to everybody, okay? It's been very...